Good morning, everyone. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the witches because you are my help. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will he rejoice, will rejoice in, God. Rejoice in God. God. All who swear all by God will glory in him. All the mouths of liars will be silenced. Will be silenced. Uh, Michael will lead us in our announcements. Hi, everybody. It's Sunday, September 4th, 2022. Today's theme, wow, and this really intrigues me. What we found enticing and how we escaped. How years, years ago, David and his friends drifted towards the religious right. Whatever you can give, just remember it's, a, it's an expression of love to David and Diane and to our whole community. But you can give by putting the camera up to the logo there. Or you can go to uh, small letters ncwc.net, or you can go through Venmo. But you'll see the QR code on our screen, and you can use it very easily. It takes you to our Givelify page, where you can choose any amount that you want to to help support our beloved community. And don't forget, we get to have communion today at the end of the session, and that for me. I just felt community with you when everybody started coming on the screen today. This Wednesday, I don't know what's happening and I'm not sure if anybody does, but some of these went back to all of these Wednesdays. We're really one body. I hope you can come this Wednesday. And now for future, as you can see on the screen on 9-11, we're gonna have a big surprise guest. Then on the 2nd of October, we're gonna have Lois Capps speaking on the new religious right and her, her husband was a very, very powerful moral leader at UCSB when I was there. I'd like to just share with you these words that are on the screen from Dr. Martin Luther King. I heard a voice saying, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for the truth, and lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. I hear the voice of Jesus saying still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never leave me alone. And I think we're going to break. That's the last chance to scan that. But we're going to break, I think, into our breakout sessions to greet each other and the love of Jesus right now, I think.
Right. Welcome back, everybody. I'm going to read two verses in a moment. And from these two verses, I, I'd like for you to consider three reminders as I read this. Number one, you have purpose. Number two, know your worth. And number three, take care of your soul. It's from 2 Timothy 2. We read, In a wealthy house, some utensils are made of gold and silver, and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for very special occasions, for special occasions, and the cheap ones are for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. Verse 20 says, a wealthy home. So today that could be in Brentwood or Pacific South Palisades or maybe Santa Barbara. But the earth is also a wealthy home. The United States as a country is a wealthy home. So in, in some sense, perhaps we all live in a wealthy home, but the passage that we just read here draws our focus to life in the wealthy home that is church. So use your imagination here. A wealthy home will have expensive things and not so expensive things. The finest items might include bone china dinnerware, the best silver, and Waterford crystal wine glasses. But the same wealthy home will have brooms, dustpans, maybe a trash compactor. This passage sheds light on, while all of the items in the house serve a purpose, you don't want to mix them up. Who would put a dustpan on the dinner table, especially while people are eating? Who would put cat food in their finest glass bowl on the floor? Okay, maybe some people would. Um, but we need to know the difference between what is costly and what is not. And we need to know the purposes they serve. In the wealthy house that is church, there are people whom God will use 
and others God can use, but not for the optimal purposes. Verse 21 said, if you keep yourself pure, you will, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. And of course, you want to serve your highest purposes. So if you are the crystal goblet, then you need to be kept in the best place, maybe a high shelf, maybe even wrapped and hidden away for a special occasion. Those who are honorably useful are selective about the company they keep not in some prudish moralizing sense, but so they can nurture their sense of self without constantly being challenged to answer for who they are. It's not a matter, it's not a matter of writing certain people off. It is a matter of bringing some people close. Back in 2016, a 27-year-old waitress went to the Standing Rock protests led by the Lakota Sioux Nation the experience left her with a sense that she was being prepared for something, but she didn't know exactly what. This waitress said, and I quote, I remember leaving that camp thinking, Lord, just do with me what you will. Allow me to be a vessel. Now, I was at Standing Rock that same November as this waitress, and I was among 12,000 people, so it's unlikely that we crossed paths, but also unlikely I would have noticed or remembered this waitress from New York City, even though she would go on to win a seat in Congress later. Like you, like the one-time waitress, I want to be a vessel. I want to be put, I pray to be put to honorable use. How is God using you what ways, how's God using you right now? You live in God's house, God's wealthy house. If someone uses a mop that was used to clean up vomit, then you might want to wash the mop before it stinks up the place. We have people in the house that are not ready to be used because they have not been properly disinfected. And yet, they have a place in the house. There was a time that I was deeply conflicted over this, especially when it comes to right-wing Christians. Now, I was not exposed directly to that kind of Christianity until I came of age. And before I talk about where I found common ground with these fellow Christians, mostly after moving to Santa Barbara in 1983, let me point out that there was plenty that I did not understand. I was drifting into a new world. What drew me in? I started listening to Christian radio when I was about 21 or 22 years old. I was attracted to some of the inspiring teachers and really thoughtful pastors. And there was the music, uh, which they don't play much of anymore, but I, I enjoyed a lot of it. I, I lived in Oxnard back then and mainly listened to KDAR, whose signal blankets Ventura County. The teachers seemed so knowledgeable. Then Diane and I and our kids, we moved to Santa Barbara. But then a decade after that, in 1994, I assumed the leadership of our church that was in Oxnard. And I'll tell you what happened in the 10 years that we were away. KDAR had become a full-on MAGA promoting, uh, I'll call it the spirit of MAGA. This was in the mid-1990s. Today, if you look at the online program guide, it's not only focused on the family, but names like Robert Jeffress, Eric Metaxas, Rob McCoy, Jay Sekulo, Charlie Kirk, all of whom endorsed Donald Trump and are known supporters, some of them known nationally. And of course, Seculo became part of Trump's legal team in the White House. By the time I returned to work in Oxnard, KDAR's parent company, Salem Broadcasting, which has stations around the country, had also launched a Spanish language station in Camarillo, KMRO, Radio Nueva Vida, which is just as conservative 
And since then, they've opened up 14 more stations for Spanish speakers. And I was still under the influence of their kind of Christianity. And yet still, I approached the manager of KDAR, and I asked why in a county with a majority of non-white people, they had not a single pastor of color. Now, much later, they added Tony Evans, a black pastor, who happens to still be conservative. So I asked him about that. And then a new manager was hired. So I met this manager and I asked him the same question. There was a short period when I personally joined their lineup. And Constina will remember this because she was instrumental in helping it happen. I think I was on like 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. Long before we had social media with its perpetuation of confirmation bias, and I don't want to discount the impact of Christian television, but my opinion is that Salem Broadcasting is largely responsible for the conservatism that continues to dominate the religious scene in Ventura County. They radicalized some sincere followers of Jesus, even plundering entire churches. I don't mean to say that most Christians listen to KTAR, but its effect is in the air because they are on the air. So let me go back to when we moved to Santa Barbara. I told you there was plenty I didn't understand. I was drifting into a new world. First thing, I didn't get why guns were so important. Second, I didn't understand why it was such a major goal to overturn Roe v. Wade. Also, I didn't understand why, why th these, this, this expression of Christianity, why they were so committed to helping people with black skin as long as they lived somewhere far, like Uganda. I didn't really understand why so many of them wanted to homeschool their kids or send them to a Christian school. I didn't understand why Christians hated taxes to the point of wanting to dissolve safety nets. I didn't understand why Christians wanted the U.S. military to dominate other people and how they didn't seem to notice the amount of melanin in the countries these Christians wanted to bomb. I grew up going to church, but now I began to hear terms that I didn't remember hearing a single time in church. Terms like embryonic stem cell research and pornography. But in my naivete, I underestimated how crucial all of these issues were to my newly discovered brothers and sisters. My idealism expected Seriously, my idealism, I was young, and I expected these churches would come together with churches of color and leave the segregated past behind. I was wrong. Instead, I saw quite a few black churches and brown churches becoming even more socially conservative, still mostly segregated. Yes, there are some diverse congregations, but their leaders are almost always white. So, yes, we have more multicultural churches, but black and brown folks only speak when spoken to when it comes to calling out white supremacy. And in those churches, queer folks are closeted. And all of these right wing religious people are my siblings. Now, why would I even want to be part of such a world, a world that didn't know me or didn't want to know me? And when they found out about me, wanted to change me. Well, here's what happened. As a youth, I had so much confidence in the message of Jesus, in the gospel, that I just knew that things could not stay the way that they were. In time, I found out that the gospel did not have that kind of power. The gospel does not have the power to reconcile institutions with opposing values. You cannot stand in solidarity with something committed to erasing your identity. The irony was that the Christian right often spoke about reconciliation, racial reconciliation. The gospel has power, but its power is reserved first for certain people. Jesus says the gospel is for the poor. 
Is Jesus saying that the gospel is not for the rich? Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Look at it this way. Not a single day goes by that a poor person doesn't think about survival. Christians may think we are blessed if we hold title to multiple properties or expect an inheritance or drive all the cars of our dreams, but Jesus does not con congratulate you for that. Yes, you own some things, or you think you do, and your family is not at risk, but you are not blessed unless you feel the shame of poverty, unless it bothers you until it gets into your system, until you feel the blunt force of unpaid bills and the strain of not knowing what you will do when September 30th comes, and if you get through that, there's October, and then November, and so on. If you don't experience the psychic trauma of futurelessness, you cannot call yourself blessed. It is immoral for us to make our neighbors invisible. It's concern for those whose backs are against the wall that saves us. Wait a minute, not concern, obsession. To be obsessed with justice. This obsession is the rope that rescuers will lower into the pit of this hateful form of Christianity into which we fell. Now, I told you I wanted to mention what I felt I had in common with conservative Christians that made it possible for me to join them. It's dogmatism. You see, I came from a dogmatic childhood church experience. We called it sound doctrine, but even with the abundance of joy and love and sense of family we could find in church, we had way too many rules. For example, we couldn't go to the movies. It's kind of funny now, but I remember when we would ride up the 101 and we could see just for a few seconds what was playing on the big screen at the Ventura drive-in, and we kids were so excited. The rules in our old world were so essential to our practice that they became dogma. And they made, I mean, the rules of our old world made the rules of our new world look not so silly. Things like, you know, being interested in gun rights and obsessing over abortion. Rules, dogmatism, purity, our sex lives were certainly monitored, but somehow without the capacity to actually talk about sex on both sides, the old world and the new world. Dogmatism allowed us to link both worlds. Immature minds and undeveloped personhood can be especially reliant on the simplicity of rules but it challenges your dogmatic presuppositions when you're trying to live in solidarity with two different groups who have different rules, especially when you're restless and you're searching for meaning. But thank God for the quest. It was asking questions that led to redemption, along with the desire for God to use me for something honorable, that is, something true to my, myself, to, uh, to, to, to why I exist, my true self. After I honored my true self by becoming more selective about the people I spent time with, discovering new friends and stepping back from others, only then was I able to speak clearly and write clearly and authoritatively about the questionless and exploitative character of right-wing religion. So now, when I speak or when I write, I do it from the deepest part of David Moore, without being concerned about whether I'm being received. I stop worrying about being loved and accepted and thought more about whether I am loving and accepting. I found liberation when I stopped searching for common ground. I kept searching and searching, and in the pursuit, I found me. That is the cleansing mentioned in this Bible verse. Not long ago, actually within the past couple of weeks, I had a friend who 
jumped onto my Facebook page after not hearing from him for, I'm going to say, a couple of years, maybe. When he, when he would ordinarily come on, he was always argumentative, always contradicted me. And I gave up trying to appeal to him on the basis of what we had in common. And he hadn't written in quite some time, but a couple of weeks ago, he came guns blazing. He was coming for me. So I, I, I private messaged him and I said, oh, oh this, this man is a, a retired pastor, used to live in Santa Barbara, but the past 30 years of his work has been in another state. And I, I, I private messaged him and said, you know, you can actually unfollow me if this is bothering you so much. And he said, and, and I was a little bit surprised by this. He said, I was just looking for dialogue. And my reply was, and you have to understand where I'm coming from at this point. I didn't, I'm not looking for a conversation because based on the past conversations, they weren't conversations. And so I replied, you don't want dialogue. You want to be right. You have little sense of mystery, but lots of certainty. No questions, all answers. And here's how he replied. Okay, David, let's say that is true. You had once offered to help me. I have to tell you that I don't even remember doing this. Maybe if I search through ancient messages, I'll find it. But he said, you had once offered to help me know Jesus, which would require me to abandon white evangelicalism. I'm very open to that. I can't tell you how many times I've read that because I don't know if it was a typo. Uh, it was so out of character from what I, I known of in the past few years. He said he's open to knowing Jesus, open to abandoning white evangelicalism. And he obviously had given considerable thought to this. Let me say that you might be like me. You've lost the patience and the stamina to talk around the impediments of dogma. But just as I escaped years ago, there are people who are looking for a way out. But I hope we don't have this sense of obligation to, to participate in every argument that arises. Because we don't find, this is about energy. And you need to make sure you've got people with you, people around you, people will, who, who, who believe in you and believe you. And that means stepping away from some people in order to engage others. Because there are some people who just need to get tired. They just need to, to wear out. So when, when he said he was you know, responding to my offer to help him know Jesus, at first I didn't have an answer. Not, you know, like, you know, do these three things and no. But then I thought there's really only one response to this. And I just said, remember Jesus. Before all of the, the luggage that was loaded on top of your, your consciousness, remember Jesus? I, I, I framed it as a statement, but I could have framed it as a question, like, remember Jesus? And so we, we have continued to, to talk, and I'm not going to get into the details because I need to allow this privacy in his life uh, as he processes. As I close, I just want to emphasize that when, when I say that we have to be cautious and guarded around this conservative way 
of doing Christianity, I am not saying that liberalism is carte blanche the way to go. It's hard for me to get my head around being the idea of being labeled or called or self-identifying identifying as liberal. I see myself as liberative. Liberative. Yeah. I had been saying it for years, and then I heard AOC say it in her campaign. I'm not coming from the left, and I'm not coming from the right. I'm coming from the bottom. May we all be liberative. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. May we be constantly renewing ourselves, finding ourselves full of energy to do God's will, to be used by God. May we never give up on that prayer. God, use me. However you want to use me, have your way in my life. Amen. Well, it's another another classic sermon. Like a, <laughs> I mean, there's so much to could pull about a hundred different talking points from that. But um, just at the very end of what you're saying, in my own life, I've been thinking I need discernment. Like that's been my word. Like I've got to be discerning about who or what or why I let into my life, and that's. That's turning into this kind of an active practice, like what ideas, what people, what explanations am I letting into my life? So um, that kind of that kind of flew out to me. But um, another thing that you said about halfway through, and this is a paraphrase, but you said you are not blessed until you feel the shame of poverty, the shame of not knowing the psychic trauma of futurelessness. It is concern for those whose backs are against the wall that saves it. Not concern, obsession. You are obsessed with justice. And that that really rang out to me. Like how, and, and sort of ties into like why I've never ever gone to church. Like I, I never went to church until I, I met this church. And it's because every church experience I had seemed to not understand that. Like that didn't seem to be at the heart of what was motivating the church. And I don't know, <laughs> That's, that seems to be the core of everything. Like how, how do you be a human if you're not obsessed with justice and filled with concern? Like right now, Pakistan's being washed away. Like how, is there a church in America that's even aware of that? I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Well, um, it, Caroline, I will say that there are churches who, who are aware of that um but the love is often very con uh, conditional yeah you know it's we want to bring food but we want to bring bibles um right <laughs> you know we we want to bring you know uh first aid and medical care but but you need to listen to our sermon um mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my our own I'm gonna open it up to anybody, but I'll just say like, you know, my husband's been doing a lot of volunteer work with with Af Afghani refugees. And we had one experience where we were sitting them and they really kind of unleashed some anger. You know, there was there was emotion, there was anger, like why has this happened to us? What and I was like, we have to be able to receive that. We have to be able to hear like some pretty righteous anger and how we contributed to the unraveling of their lives and the unraveling of their world. Yeah. And I feel like, like everything you were saying is sort of this unwillingness to hear this very righteous, very valid rage. You know, these people have a right to be rageful and we have to be willing to hear it. And I don't know, I'm going off a bit, but you're, you're, what you just said is very powerful and made me want to sort of acknowledge that. Yeah, I, I, yeah, go ahead, Shella. No, 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 go ahead. No, no, you. <laughs> well, what Caroline was saying, I just, it made me think about, you mentioned something about care, about the, the right wing church caring for 
people with you know uh, dark skin, but in the in other countries or distant. And I just wanted to hear what what does that give them? Does that really get? What does that do for that church? Because I do know that because I often wonder how do you stand for well I'll, a lot of people want this is not you know but a lot of people wonder why do you stand for right to life but someone is being killed for just because and you are not there you have there's not your voice is not there at all how can that be Who has a response to that before I say anything? Uh, Michael, come on. Thank you. Just very simply, they're living in dogma. And that, that makes me think of like, you know, queer people in Ugandan being murdered because our churches are encouraging Ugandans to view them as like the devil or demonic. It's just. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's poisonous. Shella, do you have, do you, do you want to add on to that thought? Like, if, if you, no. Do you think it's because there's a, a disconnect and these people are so far away and it's easier to look down on them because they're so distant and, oh, we're being so nice to these poor people in this, you know, foreign country and, but they won't help the person next to them because that person can actually recover and be in the same neighborhood eventually buying the same house as they will. Maybe they'll get too much power and they'll be equal with them and they wanna, they won't be able to look down on them anymore. And then you have to identify the fact that you're doing something wrong you have if you if you stand with the person right here next to you you have to say we're doing something wrong it's just like we were talking about uh food deserts and if and if you don't recognize that there is that happening in certain areas then you don't have to identify with the people who have to deal with it so you're leading uh to this my reflection is that um, this speaks to the insidiousness of white supremacy where you can't even see it sometimes um for instance you know i i remember by the time i graduated high school i knew about the salem witch trials but i didn't know much at all about the nearly 5000 black folks who were lynched how is that possible how 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 do I know about you know the smaller group of white persons, white women, in fact? Um, and I know I see I see a pattern. Uh, we have movies and books ad nauseum about World War II, and the characters are are British or they're French, maybe Italian, but in German, but. World War II also included Asia. But we see very few movies and books comparatively. I mean, seriously, uh, you know, who's going to be surprised if next month there's another World War II movie, you know, based in Europe? And historians will tell you that the Allies would not have won World War II without what the King of Belgium did to Congo. They could not have won it without the rubber. the rubber that's there. And we don't talk about the fact that during World War II, Kenya and Tanzania went to war with each other because Tanzania was German and Kenya was British. So you have these Black Africans fighting a European war. But we there's something about white supremacy that says we can cover the ground where white people hurt other white people just to show that we have, you know, th th this framework is that, that we're, we're, you know, we're equal opportunity 
uh, exploiters and killers, but we don't want to talk about what what happened in South Asia, what happens in Africa. We want to talk about how we help them, how we how we send medical missionaries, and how we, you know, how we build schools and that kind of thing. So it, it's like an embellished sense of righteousness in history. Like delusional righteousness. <laughs> yeah, delusional righteousness. Thank you, Lisa. Michael. I just remember when you were talking about World War II, how <clears throat> Mussolini and maybe Franco too, but Mussolini practiced testing his weapons on Ethiopia. Yes. And he described it, pardon me for even mentioning, he described the bombing of the Ethiopians as a flower. It just makes me want to vomit. As a flower unfolding. Yeah. Uh, I sort of keep thinking like moving forward, we're gonna need this radical empathy because we're gonna have so many people who are, are struggling as a direct result of our actions in regards to climate change. I mean, if we're, we're gonna need to have expansive, active, I don't know, like we're gonna have to do better and do better on a big scale. Do, do, you, see, do you see how this is possible? I don't know. I, I don't know how, how do you get people to understand when they refuse to even acknowledge that like the reason that Pakistan's flooding right now is pretty much solely due to our our choices that we've made over the last kind of 100 years. Yeah. So we have to make better choices as individuals in a small area because I believe in the butterfly effect. And if I can straighten out my own dang life and clean up my own life and stop being destroying the plants and poisoning the earth, then I think we can do it on a big scale, but it has to start with me personally. Yeah. Lisa, uh, you just turned a key. Would you, can you unpack that a little more? Yeah. Um, my roommate and I are um, working on composting and working on cleaning the earth and, and about not using toxins and using alternative things. You know, when you have a bug that you don't like, well, you know what? you need that bug, he's just in the wrong place. So, and you need that animal, you need that wild animal that just killed your cat. And so they're just in the wrong place. Or maybe we're in the wrong place because we took their land. We didn't just take indigenous people's land. We took these animals' lands that have no voice. And they're the ones that keep the world going. They're the ones that keep the earth going. And if we don't stop, doing what we're doing, stop damaging them, stop invading their land so they have nowhere to go, stop stealing their water so they have no drinking water so they have to come to us. We've got to stop that cycle on a personal level, me, myself, and then I can talk to my neighbors. So it's kind of like fractals. Um, it happens in a, a, a microcosmic way in, in our own experience. And, and you know, I think that one of the critical pieces of what Lisa's talking about is community. You know, we 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 have some something special here, but we're not the only ones. And the thing is that we 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 may not often hear about people coming together like we're coming together, but here's what very often uh, this is this is how it manifests. All right. We have community, and often it is church, not always church. You know, Sikhs are doing this, and, and Muslims are doing this, and Jews are doing this, and in, in indigenous folks particularly are doing this. And here's what kind of distinguishes it all. They are churches, mosques, synagogues, temples who don't own property. That's not a... a that's not incidental, because it is a statement against colonialism. It is, it is us actually living out what we claim to live out. It is uh, living in community in a way that does not need, and in fact, 
as I you know mentioned before, we wrongly call it property. It's it's territory. It's land because we don't own it. You know, we it's unseated. But uh, this this is God's, and um, you know, living and commuting, having conversations like like we have you know, frequently other people are doing the same thing. And because they don't have property, they're not going to be necessarily well known right now in this perhaps embryonic stage. But, but we are here. We, Jesus Collective is here, but there are collectives, you know, some of them meet, like there's one in here in uh, Oakview area that meets under a tree. Well, probably not today. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes it's not even indoors. It's just people coming together. Mm -hmm. There was a, I think it was in the New York Times, a story the other day about a woman in India who's dedicated her life to replanting trees. And like, you know, she's just, you know, an, an elderly woman of limited resources. And, and she's kind of reforested a pretty big tract of land. And that's, you know, sort of an expansion of what Lisa's saying is like, you know, you think that my actions really can't move the needle, but, you know, this one woman has moved the needle in a pretty big way in her community. Lisa yeah. used the term butterfly effect. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been riding my bike to work and it feels sketchy and dangerous and I don't particularly enjoy doing it, but I'm thinking like, well, this is me trying to sort of live my words. <laughs> But it is like taking my life in the hands, going over with the 101 on SeaWorld. I'm just like, this feels like a really bad idea <laughs> every time I do it. Thanks to you, we have fresh air today, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> all me, all me. <laughs> you with your little danger bike. <laughs> who, who hasn't spoken yet? I know there's a lot of people with thoughts who haven't piped up. Uh, I'm going to call on somebody if somebody doesn't pipe up. Margie, Margie wants to say something. Well, um, this is kind of maybe on a different tangent, and I ha this is really a question. Um, you know, um, I I've heard from, like, I think his name is Haidt. I can't remember his first name, H-A-I-D-T, but he's like a more, he's like a centrist, and he feels like, well, the left has certain value, value systems, and then the right has certain value systems, and they just are coming from opposing viewpoints. Like, for instance, like, the right is all about tradition, you know, and, um, you know, the left is... I can't remember the, the contrasting thing, but obviously it's more about change and improvement. But, um, but the thing that really gets me about it is like, I think that hurts us as Americans is there's this really, really strong narrative of who America is and what America is and what we do. And, and that is really wrong. And it is, it's, it's, you know, it perme it's permeated with white supremacy. And I think that's part of the problem, like, especially in, in education, I just feel like um, it, there needs to almost be a new narrative of who we are as a people so that like our, I mean, I think our children are questioning that because they don't have the American dream. Like I think um, Joaquin said that that one time, you know, that he just doesn't even believe in it anymore, the so-called American dream. So anyway, I just kind of feel like from a systemic perspective, I think education, you know, I feel like we can do little things there. Like just ask questions like how, like, you know, I also never knew about lynchings, but I knew about the Holocaust, you know, so little things like that. I know like Venture Unified is trying to, you know, bring that in a little bit at a time and trying to sway teachers who may have more of a traditional, you know, perspective. So that, that's just something I have some questions on too, but I just wanted to put that out there. Jonathan Haidt, right? Yeah. The, the Righteous Mind. The Righteous Mind. So here's what, you know, I read, I read that book uh, a while back, and this is what I think happens when, when someone offers an analysis. You need to mute. Yeah. When, when someone has an analysis, but they're not, either they're not poor or connected with people of color, uh, and they don't feel the trauma of futurelessness. They... You know, I mean, it's a very scholarly book. You know, he's a very intelligent guy. But when I read it, I just said, um, you know, 
that's good thinking, but we need solutions. And he was going in that direction as far as I was concerned. Yeah, he he just he's very descriptive of the different moral pillars of the left and right. Um, things like Margie was talking about and authority, you know, revering authority on the right and so on. But I really am challenged by some of the things you were saying, and I need to go back to the transcript um, to get the exact wording because um, it's just something I keep um, oscillating between is trying to find that common ground, <laughs> you know, and I've read all these books trying to find common ground, but there comes a time when you just say, no, that's not it you yeah. know there's that's just plain wrong <laughs> and i can't remember the wording you used but you, you were talking about the undeveloped personalities and you know immature minds and how they need these boundaries you know um to describe who's to make paint themselves in basically and everyone else out especially people of color and and i remember uh bob harper had um a sermon once about well more than one sermon about the stages of christian development the first one being or maybe it was the second one where you you find out what you believe by establishing what you can and cannot do and then that's how you paint yourself in as the saved ones. Um, and you grow out of that, or well, sometimes you just don't. I remember him saying, but the, you know, then you move on to the stages of Christianity where you can see nuance, where you can see outside of um, your safety zone and so on. Um, and some people just never move out of that unless they're challenged. And maybe that's where we need to be is more challenging and just saying, no, yeah. that's not how it is. Yeah, the quest for common ground can, can, be, um, can be very frustrating. And this is about how much energy do you have to live? Right, yes. And, and so, um, it's, it's really beautiful to find people that you can find mutual restoration with. And then there may be occasion where someone is open to a conversation and to expose that they have, they're willing to concede some, that there's some common ground. But we should not put this burden on ourselves that we are obligated to convert people to a different point of view um, when they are, you know, hell bent on um, being hell bent. <laughs> I just feel so much compassion for them in a way because they are trapped in a bubble as we can find ourselves yeah. oftentimes uh, by the media. And sometimes they just don't hear the truth anywhere. But you know, if they're in a, if they're in a bubble that serves them and rewards them and makes them very happy, like you're, you're just going to drive yourself crazy trying to change their minds. Yeah. So, but again, you know, the whole point of me preaching about this today is that we just, we want it to be available. We want God to use us, right? We, so we're saying, use me, Lord, but the Lord knows where and how we can be used and when we can be used. And we need to be sensitive to that. Yeah. Who else hasn't had a chance to make a comment and would like to contribute? Uh, well, you know, the, can I make one other, like when at the very beginning, when you were talking about like the sort of the crystal versus the everyday vessels? Yeah. Um, one thing I was thinking is that I have all this beautiful stuff that I got from my grandparents. But these things that actually bring value into my life are the things that I use every day. So it's a little oh, say, say, that, say that again. Um, I, I, it's just funny, like sometimes like the things that actually, 
that I use and bring value are the simplest, most sort of humble things because they're the things that are actually mm. useful and that I bring into my life every day. So I, I don't well, know. That's it's wise to know where to attach value, right? <laughs> yeah. And it, it's just funny. I have all this beautiful stuff, but it, in a way, it doesn't actually bring any value into my life. So I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's just a random, random observation. Yeah. I think Rosie has something. I, I'm sorry, I, uh, Joaquin and I are having a late breakfast and so we're out out here in Ventura, but um, enjoying and listening. Um, the, there's so much to take from the message today. It was, it was good, but there is so much that it, it cannot be simplified in my opinion. I tend to always be that uh, odd person out because I speak what I feel and what I see and what I know, uh, I, you know, from the person, not just from the perspective of like my life experiences, but historically as well as what I saw and, and learned growing up and those, those values that were, that were, um, inculcated in my life and it's um too simple i think to just say that um there, there there's there's so much that needs to be done you know when the issue of the lynching is not it, 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 it's not only the lynchings of our black brothers and sisters but of the indigenous and the the Mexico Americanos as well. I mean, um, you know, still in the 1900s, you know, um, there were many states that were actively lynching Mexicans and- um, Especially California. Uh, well, Texas and yeah, Louisiana. The Southwest. But I you think know, there were over 50 in California. Um, I mean, all, 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 all over, you know, and that, that can't be overlooked either. You know, during the recession, there were so many people that were repatriated, American, American, quote unquote, North American born, um, that were repatriated back to uh, the different states in Mexico. And, um, you know, never, that's not talked about in the, in the history books, you know. Yeah. Um, and yes, you know, Margie brought up a, a great point about the value and importance of education. However, we need to amend it to, to be inclusive of the truths that, that, that took place, you know. Um, uh, what, what is people calling it right now? Uh, critical race theory. We've lived that. It's it's true. It is real. And and because it's given this terminology that uh, the right wingers have you know uh, clung to and um, uh, used to to further um, discriminate and ostracize and completely obliterate. Um, the truths of the lives of any person other than white supremacists for the most part, because even your poor white people, they pit against people of color as if to say they, you're superior, you know, and it's well, a class struggle. It's so many struggles. Uh, uh, Rosie, you personally are an example of why we cannot just rely on Jonathan Haidt uh, and that kind of analysis. Uh, we, we need to have a comprehensive analysis from the bottom like, like you always tend to offer. So, But it's time for us to have communion now, everybody. So we say to you, O oh God, once again, we want to be used by you. 
<sighs> may it come with a sense of freshness. I mean, this, this availability that we are pronouncing may come with a sense of freshness and expectancy as, uh, as uh, Lisa was pointing to. May, may we have this expectancy that our work is not in vain, that our, our living is not in vain, that uh, our communion is not in vain, that we are finding purpose in doing things that may not register on a grand scale right now, or may not noticeably register on a grand scale. But when we do what you call us to do, when we say, use me, Lord, when we do what you called us to do, greater things are happening. We trust that we're part of your magnificent work, your universal magnificent work. And so we come to you with the bread and the cup in memoriam and said, do this in remembrance of me. And as I said to my friend who was open, newly open, I said, remember Jesus. That's what communion is. We, we have so many things that we try to, or some try to add on. We want to remember Jesus right now. We are liberationists. We believe in the Jesus who breaks every chain, breaks every chain, breaks every chain. This is the body and the blood of our Redeemer. Would you eat and drink? As we go, let me just say that uh, uh, often churches kind of financially tank during the summer, but we're holding our own. Um, but there, you know, it's not like there's margin or anything. And uh, I mentioned to one person a need that we had. Um, if you notice, there was static last last week during the music, and Matt said we should get a new mixer. And I mentioned it to somebody probably prefers to stay anonymous and I was just bringing 